Welcome everybody to the to our final webinar for the spring series. I'm Jerry Friedman, I'm co-chair of Elders Climate Action, and we are just thrilled to have uh, leaders from the youth climate movement here with us tonight. They're going to be talking about their movement and how we can engage and um, you, hopefully you will learn a lot from each of them and <clears throat> um, I'm going to introduce each of them to you and then each of the, I'm not going to read their bios, you will get their bios with the recording tomorrow and then each of, each of these uh, representatives will um, give an introduction to themselves and their organization. And then we've got some questions and hopefully you will learn a lot and um, so will they um, about um, youth climate movement. There's a Q&A box. If you hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A box. If you have questions, please put them in there and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of all the presentations. I would like to just let you know who we have with us today. We have Ariel Martinez Cohen from Zero Hour, Jerome Foster II from The Climate Reporter, Leah Harrell from iMatter, Alex Loznak uh, from Our Children's Trust, and Varshini Prakash from the Sunrise Movement. We also have Corel Ridie White, who will answer any questions about Our Children's Trust, but he's not gonna be presenting. You're gonna be hearing from Alex. And tonight, our first presenter is going to be Arielle uh, Martinez Cohen from Zero Hour. She's going to introduce herself a little bit and tell you about their organization, how they function, and um, give you much more information about Zero Hour. So welcome, Arielle, and um, please begin your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hey, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Arielle Martinez Cohen. Um, I'm 17 years old and a senior in high school in Los Angeles, California. Um, I'll be attending Brown University next fall, so I'm really excited for that. And yeah, I'm the partnerships director for Zero Hour, and I also wrote the official song Two Minutes to Minute for the movement. Um, and yeah, so I love, I'm really passionate about combining music and activism as well. Um, I also work locally with the Youth Climate Strike Movement and Fridays for Future. Um, so a little bit about Zero Hour. We focus mostly on advocacy for climate justice. Um, we really want to bring awareness to the intersection between racism and classism and sexism and colonialism and a bunch of different systems of oppression and how they intersect with the climate movement. Um, we actually put on the first Youth Climate March last summer um, in Washington, D.C. and in 25 other locations around the world. Um, and so we so then we marched for climate action and we also lobbied in D.C. Um, with meetings for 46 um, congressional members. Um, and we actually worked with Sunrise a little bit on that using their no fossil fuel money pledge. Um, and some other things that we did, we filed an amicus brief with the um, Join Juliana campaign that's linked with the Youth Feed Gov lawsuit and our Children's Trust. We have some representatives from those organizations here today. Um, we also are now working to train hundreds of ambassadors around the country to speak in their communities about climate justice and get other youth involved in the movement. Um, and so that's called our hashtag getting to the roots of climate change campaign. We're working on that as well as a summit that we're putting on this summer, July 13th and 14th um, in Miami to also get more young people into the climate movement because you know that's so important. Um, that's one of the things that Zero Hour really focuses on. We, um, we sorry, I just lost my chain of thought. Um, you know, so they, the youth climate movement has actually, you know, there's a lot of studies coming out um, that show that the youth movement is actually creating waves and making real change. Um, it's showing that the amount of climate deniers in the U.S. is actually going down. Um, and this has been linked to 
um, young people and their work, you know, to bring more awareness and to tell their parents about um, climate change and all this stuff. So um, that's pretty cool. And also in Europe, we just saw with the EU election, um, a lot more Green Party members being elected because um, in part of the Rise for Future movement over there. So that's kind of the gist of what Zero Hour does. And yeah, that's me. Thank you, Ariel. That was great. Um, now we will hear from um, Varshini from the Sunrise Movement. Um, so if you can um, unmute yourself and begin, please. Sure. Um, I apologize if I am a little bit choppy. I'm currently in the middle of and I'm not sure. Yeah, I might cut out here and there. So just let me know. Um, but thank you, Ariel. And so good to hear about Zero and what y'all are up to. You've been killing it over the last year. Um, so I am, my name is Varshini. I am one of the co-founders of Sunrise Movement, currently serving as the executive director. And Sunrise is, is building a movement of young people who have watched over the last few decades in disbelief and outrage and frustration at the lack of, of moral and political courage shown by our leaders in this country. Um, and we're united to fight back against that. Um, so the seeds of Sunrise really began in as early as late 2015, early 2016, but we really launched in the middle of 2018 with a blueprint for a strategy for how to make climate change, uh, climate action rooted in racial and e uh, economic justice an urgent priority across America. And we created this strategy by combining the power uh, of, of two really potent theories of change, power of social movements, of protest organizing, alongside electoral and, and elections and electoral politics. Um, and we wanted to create this movement for and by young people that would build people power, that would build political power in this country and would team up with movements across America to define a new common sense in this country. That the last 40 years of corporate capture of our government has caused the greatest levels of inequality we've seen in a century. And it's created this toxic prevailing idea that government is bad, that it should be as small as possible, and that there are winners and losers in our economy. And that has largely led to the crisis that we're experiencing today. Um, so we're hoping to create a new common sense in America to harness the power of the public sector for good, the greatest credit life is, and build a government and a society that works, that finally can work for all people. So the focus of our efforts has largely been on uh, getting fossil fuel money out of our political system. As Ariel mentioned around the no fossil fuel money pledge, really been working uh, hard on that as well to ensure that people who want to hold the highest levels of office in our country um, are not beholden to the oil and gas interests that have prevented us from taking action for the last 50 years. Um, we've been working to elect climate champions office. We actually run almost every year, run a, a massive youth electoral program of new leaders uh, into the movement for, for years to come. And we've been for the last eight months of working on this thing called the Green New Deal. And that is really pushing for solutions that are actually commensurate to the scale of the problem at hand. Not a little tax here, not a little fee over there, but solutions that are at scale and actually address people's daily lives. Um, so just a very quick case study in what we do to, to get it kind of specific. Uh, I want to go back to the sit-in that we did on November 13th, 2018, that kind of catalyzed this moment around the Green New Deal. And after Tuesday, Ocasio-Cortez was a part of, and within 48 hours of that action, there were over 5,000 articles written about a Green New Deal and climate. Um, there was this huge, something really broke through, and it happened like, within 24 hours. We couldn't even believe what was going on. That Wednesday, we had just three co-sponsors on this uh, resolution to build a committee for a Green New Deal. Thursday, we realized that that would, if we didn't build momentum, this all was going to die. 
And so we called all our friends to drive back to DC and we did an action Friday on Congressman Frank Pallone, who had been uh, blocking progress on this committee for a Green New Deal. That weekend, we got 500 people on a call to take action to take action that following Tuesday to visit their congressional officials, their local offices. Then it was Thanksgiving, everybody took a little bit of that. Um, and Monday after Thanksgiving, there were 800 people who got back on a mass call. We told them, come to DC on December 10th. And within just two weeks of this previous action, we brought over a thousand young people back to DC. We held 46 simultaneous lobby visits and three sit-ins. And by the end of December, that December 10th weekend, we had over 46 congressional backers and several presidential candidates that were out there championing the Green New Deal. And uh, um, that laid the groundwork for all of the work to come. So that's just like a little bit of how we merge both the political and the social movement. And I'll leave it there for now, but I'm happy to answer questions after. Thank you so much, Prashini. That was awesome. Um, we're going to move on. Um, right now, we're going to hear from Alex um, from our Children's Trust and hear what they, he's doing and what our Children's Trust is doing and their goals. So, Alex. Um, well, thanks so much for having me, and it's an honor to be uh, on this panel. You can hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, so, as you heard, my name is Alex Loznak. Um, I am one of the 21 youth plaintiffs in the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case, Juliana v. United States, where we are challenging uh, the climate change policies of the U.S. government, uh, including the policies of the Trump administration specifically, but also systemic policies uh, that have been in place for decades. Um, so a little bit, I'll say just a little bit about myself personally before moving into a little bit more detail about the case, as well as uh, the organization, uh, Our Children's Trust, which I'm here uh, representing um, along with Corey. Um, so I just graduated from college uh, one week ago uh, at Columbia in New York City. Uh, I studied sustainable development and political science. Uh, so obviously my, you know, my studies are closely related to uh, my activist work. Uh, and I'm now back home uh, on a family farm in Oregon. It's about as far away from New York City as you can get uh, within, the, within the continental US. Um, and it's a very, very different place. Uh, it's a farm that my family has actually owned for about 150 years. Uh, and we have organic uh, hazelnuts, we have grass-fed beef um, and other uh, sustainable produce. Uh, and the family farm is actually impacted very heavily by climate change, which ties into the court case and is part of why I have uh, legal standing to uh, take these executive agencies like the EPA uh, to court in federal court in this case. Um, so getting into a little bit more detail about uh, Juliana v. USA, uh, this has been called the most important lawsuit on the planet uh, by Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben um, and a number of thought leaders in the climate sphere have really pointed to this case as an incredibly important part of the climate movement, um, you know, similar to previous historical social movements, uh, such as the civil rights movement, for instance, uh, we, there is a legal uh, branch to the movement, a legal arm to the movement that can really work alongside uh, the political movement, as well as the you know, grassroots organizing and protest side of the movement. So, it, you know, in, in the civil rights movement, for instance, there was the landmark uh, Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, which is probably the closest precedent to the vision that we are putting forward uh, for this case. Um, in that, you know, in that lawsuit, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered uh, U.S. school districts to desegregate. And that decision was a central uh, component of the civil rights movement alongside the political uh, progress, uh, such as the Civil Rights Act, as well as the uh, protest, you know, protest in the street, such as, you know, the famous uh, March on Washington. Uh, and that is really how, similar to how we see our case fitting into the climate movement 
today. Um, we've got incredible organizations such as Sunrise that are working on the electoral political side and, and Zero Hour, which are working on uh, mobilizing people in the street. Uh, we are trying to get uh, the courts onto our side as well. So specifically, uh, what the Juliana case, uh, where I'm one of the plaintiffs, specifically what we are uh, arguing is that the, uh, the U.S. government is violating um, young people's fundamental constitutional rights to life and liberty through all of its systemic policies that actually uh, perpetuate and exacerbate climate change. So a few of those policies include uh, subsidizing fossil fuel energies uh, to the tune of billions of dollars every year, uh, as well as leasing out federal lands for um, fossil fuel production. Um, so these systemic policies are responsible for uh, most, if not all, uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the U.S. historically is responsible for about a quarter of total uh, human greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. So we can trace most of that uh, impact uh, directly to the U.S. government uh, and its policies. Um, so my, my 20 co-plaintiffs and I in this case are essentially asking uh, the courts to uh, first uh, declare that the government is violating our fundamental constitutional rights and specifically find that there is an implied uh, constitutional right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life. Um, you know, this would be similar to other uh, implied uh, rights that the Supreme Court has read into the Constitution, such as uh, the right to marriage, which was recognized in the, the landmark uh, gay marriage case, uh, Obergefell v. Hodges, uh, in 2015. Um, so there is a precedent for this, for the Supreme Court to find new constitutional rights in times of urgent uh, national need, recognize those rights, and then issue uh, orders to the government to require the government to protect those rights. So in, that, in our case, uh, sorry, I'm running, <laughs> running out of time here, uh, but in our case, what that would look like if we were to prevail in the, in the case uh, would be for the court to order the U.S. government to prepare a national plan to reduce uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much, Alex. That was incredible. Um, we're going to move on now to Leah from iMatter. Um, she's going to introduce herself and her organization. Go ahead, Leah. Hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm excited to be in the presence of so many <laughs> amazing climate leaders here. My name is Leah Harrell, and I'm a high school senior from Minnesota. Um, in the fall, I'll be attending Claremont McKenna College in California. So I'm a part of a number of youth climate organizations, but today I am representing iMatter, which is a national organization that supports youth in asking for bold climate action from their local city governments. And we focus specifically on the local level action because oftentimes city governments get overlooked in discussions about climate action due to the fact that um, we tend to underestimate their level of influence on our economies and our livelihoods. Um, but they are an important component of climate solutions because it is crucial to work on all levels of government in order to create meaningful, lasting solutions. So about a year ago, with the support of iMatter, I formed a community coalition of students, uh, scientists, business leaders, faith leaders, um, and we're working with my hometown city of Minnetonka to create a proposal for a climate action plan. And a climate action plan is essentially a, a long-term outline of how we can meet aggressive climate goals um, that we've set for 100% renewable energy citywide by 2030 and net zero greenhouse gas emissions also citywide by 2040. Now, over the past few months, we have been researching our city and our neighboring cities, um, and we've created a report that we, that we will be presenting to the Minnetonka City Council on June 17th. Um, we hope they will um, accept our proposal and that we will continue to work with the city, uh, both in the creation and implementation of our climate action plan. So that's kind of iMatter um, nationwide. These, uh, 
city organizations, city coalitions are working together and they're creating meaningful change um, on a, a smaller level than what we typically see in the media. Um, but a unique part of iMatter is also that this year they were instrumental in supporting a state level movement um, called Minnesota Can't Wait. So this movement formed uh, back in the summer of 2018 after a number of local iMatter groups around the Twin Cities area and greater Minnesota came together to apply our experience from creating city level change to work to try and influence uh, state level change. And um, we were actually inspired by the National Green New Deal and all that everything that Sunrise is doing. Um, and we wanted to create a Minnesota version. So a Minnesota Green New Deal bill, which is actually, it was introduced uh, April 11th of this year. And it was the first youth led bill of its kind in the nation. So very exciting. <laughs> yeah, Varshin, I see you're, um, you're cheering. Yeah, so it was awesome. Yeah, we were really excited. Um, we consulted with a number of different uh, stakeholders in Minnesota, different communities. Um, but unfortunately, the Minnesota Senate did not listen to our calls for action um, because some politicians still think that climate action and the idea of protecting our future is a partisan issue. Uh, so we did not get significant climate action passed this year. Um, and it is a little disheartening. It sometimes is, um, you know, makes you not want to go on, but this kind of sense of frustration with how people are not listening to the urgency and how our politicians are not stepping up and leading is what's driving the young people to be the leaders themselves and ourselves um, and to continue to push to uh, achieve the policies that are based on what the science says is necessary, not what is politically possible or deemed easy. Um, so it is a challenge, but we are working to revise the bill to include more input from more voices um, to make it a more equitable, uh, but still holding true to the science um, and making sure that, um, you know, it is true to a Green New Deal. It is revolutionary. It is what we need to solve a climate crisis. Um, so we're going to work on that bill over the summer and hopefully introduce it next session. Um, and with this uh, kind of initial state level Green New Deal bill, we hope to build blueprints for other states to also create their own uh, state level bills if, again, we are not able to push for a national level Green New Deal. Uh, so again, getting at that aspect of working on multiple levels of government is really how uh, we create that meaningful change. Um, and it'll help us transition to a green, equitable, just, sustainable economy for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. It's very inspirational to hear um, a youth movement and organization proposing legislation rather than lobbyists. Um, that's, you know, where we need to be. Uh, right now, we're going to go over to Jerome Foster from The Climate Reporter, and you'll hear about what he, who he is and what he's doing. Jerome, to you. Hi, thank you. My name is Jerome Foster II. I'm, 16, I'm 17 years old and I'm a junior in high school and I'm, I founded The Climate Reporter. I'm the founder and editor in chief and I started it when I was in 10th grade and basically it started as a blog for me just posting about the environment and about facts about just climate justice and the youth environmental movement and now it has grown to have over eight countries and over 40 different writers and it has led to in Australia for like an example there was an activist who wrote about how there's not that many people that are interested in environmental activism in his, in his community. And once he wrote a bunch of articles about it, he held a national climate strike and he had hundreds of people tune out. And that was, he said that was indirect um, impact because of the articles he was writing with the climate reporter. And also the climate reporter works to basically provide a platform where people can learn about climate change, whether you know very little about it or you know a lot about it. It is a hub for people to be able to, um, basically understand climate change from just being to change the narrative of just being that there's animals in danger and that it there's some people that are they'll be privileged enough to escape climate change to say to actually have people that are in america in miami in communities that people say are too privileged to go through climate change to actually say no this climate change is happening everywhere and we have to act as a united front because it's impacting every human being on the planet equally um i'm also just to give a background about myself I'm an intern on the House of Representatives, and also I'm a climate reality leader, and I'm one of the I'm the organizer of the White House climate strike, 
And also I'm starting my own environmental organization this year, um, which will focus on plastic production reduction, such as um, plastic water bottles, and also work to make sure that um, young, make sure that communities aren't just um, being um, too wasteful with our plastic and making sure that when we are trying to use plastic, we aren't containing something that kills people, which is plastic and kills fish in ecosystems, and something that provides life, which is water, and which is the food that we eat every day. And just trying to change that narrative where people just see plastic as not a container for everything, but actually being a destroyer of our planet and something that we have to change and something that we have to actively work to fight against. And um, right now we're launching that out. We're working, um, to, um, we're working to launch that out in the mass media, um, the mass, and to all across the U.S. And also I'm launching another um, voting campaign to basically energize my generation to make sure we go vote in 2020. So that's really what I'm working on right now. And I think the Climate Reporter really started that out where, uh, where basically it opened up the environmental movement where more people were able to learn about it and not have to learn about the obscure things where people would just throw facts at people and say, by this date, 50% of such and such will go away. Where the Climate Reporter would do is they'll say, this is a person and they live in a community that is in the US or in a community that is in um, anywhere around the world. And this is their story. This is how climate change is impacting them. And this is how we can actually act and make significant and substantial steps to make sure that we're stymieing the climate crisis. And we go beyond just saying you need to take personal steps, but say that you need to go and call your member of Congress, vote for, um, vote not, you don't have to agree with us. You just have to make sure that you are voting and make sure that you are actually making sure that everyone's opinions and everyone's beliefs are represented. And that's really what the Climate Reporter does is just allows people to be inducted into the environmental movement and provide some information around it. Thank you so much, Jerome. So now you've heard, you've heard from everybody um, and you can see how different each organization is and how inspirational um, they all are doing major work. Um, I don't know when anybody has time to have fun um, because <laughs> this is a, it seems to be a, a full-time and plus job for all of you. But now we're going to, we'll go in the same order. But we have some more questions. Um, this question is, for each of you, how do you envision an elders and youth movement moving towards restoring the climate? And, and then what do you think elders can do to engage with the youth climate action movement? How can, how can elders support the youth climate action movement? And how do you see them engaging? Um, so Barshini, we'll start with you. Um, and um, if you can just answer that question, if you need me to repeat it, I will. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you. I love huge believer in intergenerational organizing. This is so life-threatening an issue. There is literally no other option. Um, actually, a few years ago, I was arrested protesting the largest coal plant in Massachusetts alongside people of all ages. And that memory will always just be burned to my mind of like being arm in arm, not just with young people, but with people of all ages and, and us collectively uh, as a people putting our bodies on the line. So I think for something like the Green New Deal and is a decades long project, it's not 2020, it's not 2021, or even the next five years, this is a decades long project to succeed. We need a chorus of voices far beyond just organizations like Sunrise or the ones that are here. Um, so I think what we need is we don't need accolades. But what we need is for you all to get as organized and as militant as possible. And we only have a few years to make a meaningful impact. Like I'm listening to Leah talking about as a result of the votes that people took in, that dis in those districts, people should lose their seats because of the decisions that they made. And there's a lot of work that you can do from that even if you're you know, somewhat legally constrained. So I, what I would love to see is folks really stepping up to engage in campaigns that people are running. Um, whether it is like showing up at your congressional official's door like every single day to make your voice heard about what what people need to serve. Whether it is like 
organizing strikes in solidarity with the youth strikes that are happening across the, the country and the world. Um, whatever it is, I think for Sunrise in particular, we're looking for people um, to really throw down on this Green New Deal campaign and, and make it virtually untenable for politicians, at least any Democrat, but politicians more broadly, uh, to, to exist in office while still taking oil and gas money and not supporting solutions that are commensurate to the scale of the crisis. Um, to action holding um, and you can get involved with that at sunrisemovement.org. So you don't just have to be uh, a young person to participate in those. So that's what I'd say for right now, and I'll kick it to other people to respond as well. Thank you, Varshini. All right, the same question to you, Ariel. Um, I can repeat it if you like. Do you want me to repeat the question? Um, I think I got it. I got it okay. on the end of off here. All right, now. great. But thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, I just want to second what Varshini said. Um, and just say how excited I am to see all of these different actions coming together this summer and, and next year around the 2020 campaign and getting young people to vote. And I think this is a great area where we can build an intergenerational movement, um, whether that be around lobbying elected officials or um, writing legislation or um, joining adult strikes in solidarity with the youth climate strikes. Um, I think it's really exciting. Um, another thing that I would say could be a great role, um, you know, for adults and elders um, to support the youth movement um, would be to talk to kids and grandkids and even like um, parents about letting young people strike because I know a lot of times kids have trouble with that and um, you know their, their parents may not be super supportive not um, allowing them or helping them get out to these different events um, to show their support and so this could be a huge thing um, to help with that um, and I think um, yeah I think um, just those two things could really help with the movement. Great, thank you. Um, Alex, to you, how would you respond to that? Absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, both youth and elders really have a lot to bring uh, to the fight to save the climate. Uh, specifically, I think that young people really have our energy and moral, moral authority uh, because we're the ones who are really going to have to deal with the impacts of climate change uh, over this, uh, this next century. Uh, elders, at the same time, I think can bring uh, the wisdom of their experience, um, as well as their technical expertise um, in fields such as science uh, and law, uh, and be able to really bring that expertise to bear to sort of help guide uh, youth toward really achieving uh, climate justice. Um, I think, it, and to, so to give you one example of that, uh, you know, in our uh, Juliana case, one of the experts who is testifying is uh, Dr. James Hansen, uh, who testified to Congress all the way back in 1988, uh, well, long before I was born, uh, to say that global warming was already starting to have an impact and cause record setting temperatures. So he's bringing that expert testimony into the case. Uh, at the same time, his granddaughter, uh, my friend, Sophie Kiblihan, is one of the plaintiffs in the case. And so she's bringing her energy and passion and moral authority uh, also uh, into the courtroom. Um, one other point that I would make is that, you know, uh, you hear a lot of discussion about the importance of educating uh, youth about climate change. And I think that definitely is important and you would never hear me say anything negative about education. Uh, but I think we also need to recognize that many, many, many youth, uh, I would say most youth are already very well informed about climate change and we are really crying out uh, for solutions. And so I think that organizations that are uh, run by our elders uh, really should focus on lifting up the youth voice and providing uh, a platform and a pedestal for us to be able to uh, spread our message. Um, so I, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 there's, you know, so to give an example, I within within the case, I uh, you know we're getting to really tell these very powerful uh, personal stories about how us as individuals are impacted by climate change. Um, my my friend, uh, my co-plaintiff Levi, who is I I think uh, 13 years old now, uh, lives on a barrier island in Florida where he's just a few feet above sea level, and so they're dealing with sea level rise, they're dealing with storm surge. Um, these stories are, are so powerful and older organizations, I think, really can do a lot to be able to raise, raise those uh, issues and let us tell, you know, let youth really tell our stories and amplify our voice. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, Leah, we'll go to you. Yes, so, <clears throat> well, okay, in the, in the media, we often see youth movements portrayed as purely youth-led, and though there are some incredibly amazing youth, youth activists who do things way beyond their years, and I applaud every single one of them, um, all of these movements have behind the scenes a support system of adults who make these accomplishments possible, um, and sometimes that goes unnoticed. Uh, and in my experience with iMatter and in Minnesota Can't Wait, adults have been key mentors to youth leaders in uh, supporting policy development and assisting with communication between other organizations and politicians and organizers, um, helping with press strategies and campaign arcs and various other aspects of creating and sustaining um, a movement. So if you're looking to try and get involved or if you want to know how you can help, if you have any expertise in, in any area or if you just want to be there for moral support, there's always a way to plug in and be a part of that adult support system who's kind of, um, someone said to me, is putting the, the grease in the wheels. It's making everything run smoothly um, to make sure that uh, the young people are able to get their voices heard to the fullest extent. Um, and I also wanna bring up another point. Um, there are so many climate movements going on right now and sometimes it's hard to keep track of them. Sometimes they do overlap and sometimes they're quite separate. Um, but it's really important that these movements stay um, connected, that there's communication, there's collaboration between them. Because when one movement um, shares something with another movement, they suddenly have double the audience and you're, you're reaching more people, you're able to spread your message more. So I really want to emphasize we need to continue these collaborations um, reaching across organizational lines um, and bringing people together who might typically not be um, coming together on the same project and really understanding that we need intersectional work in order to address an intersectional um, issue such as the climate crisis. So um, senior adults, again, plug in, support system, and then really branch out, find new parties, uh, new people, and, and start spreading the message, um, make those connections. Thank you, Leah. That was awesome. Uh, Jerome, would you like to try and um, give us a response to that question? Yes. So when I when I think about when we're talking about like intergenerational work and, and uniting older generations and younger generations, I would say that a common thing that I see older generations say is that we that we have wisdom and my response to that is saying that younger people have innovation and that they through technological advancements. And I would say that in an, in an environmental movement and in an effective movement, it takes both. It takes both wisdom and innovation and it takes younger generations and older generations. And when we talk about that, there is a duality in saying that you, they're saying that I, older generations are saying that they're, they're divided because of their age, but we're united because we're human. And if we're united because we're human, that means that we're united in crisis. So we have to be united in our solution. So that's the key system that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about intergenerational work, because this doesn't impact just one demographic, it impacts the whole of humanity and that's how we must act. Thank you, thank you so much. So I, ha I have another question for you guys and see if, um, and it's something, um, that we certainly struggle with, and I'm, I'm sure that you do also. And that is, what, what do you see as being the greatest barrier to solving climate change? Um, so, oh, Varshini, you want to start out on that? 
Oh boy. Um, you just want one? <laughs> cool. The, the um, biggest barrier. Yeah, I know there is no, there is no one barrier. If there was, it would be easy. But which is the which is the most outstanding um, from your perspective? Cool. There are a lot, and so I'm, maybe I'll speak to one that I am just thinking about a lot this week. Um, one of the biggest things that which right and through reading i'm sure a lot of you have noticed as well is that the right has been building and and, and fossil fuel executives and politicians who they are buddy buddy with have been building the infrastructure to defeat us for 40 to 50 years and they are using infrastructure that was used by their predecessors who did who did the same um you know public camp the tobacco industry before that and i think just the more i um, grapple with the seriousness with which they take winning it makes me realize like how behind our side is in really putting together the sophisticated infrastructure the the networks um, everything from like the mo mass mobilization infrastructure, the communications and policy tools and, and, and uh, like a coherent narrative, um, everything from, you know, like a 50, like an actual organizing plan. Um, one of our biggest challenges as people who care about the climate crisis, people who care about justice will be like, can we actually forgive my language, can we get our shit together enough to cohesively organize in a big way with big time resources and big time alignment to actually build out policies on a mass scale and, and sort of get our head above uh, the like waters of our own internal organization and our internal drama and internal um, I think I think it's actually something that's remarkable because we've seen how other movements um, like LGBTQ movements, like the movement to get the ACA passed and, and more have, have uh, in some way, that's what I'll say. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I know there's not, it, it, there are so many barriers, but if you think of which is the most overarching for you or from your perspective, um, Ariel, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, that's such a huge question. Um, of course, there are so many different barriers to getting, being successful in climate action. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is the fact that, you know, it's kind of more about um, fighting, not like not only bringing awareness to people who deny climate change flat out, people who say it doesn't even exist, but it's more about like the people who just, you know, acknowledge that it exists, but don't actually take action. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest issues because there's a lot of people in power right now who don't, don't believe, you know, like don't believe that, you know, the Green New Deal, things like the Green New Deal or other proposals that include climate justice and include equity in our society as we fight the climate crisis. They don't think that that's realistic, that they don't think that that's what we need, even though they do think that climate change is real. Is real. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that we're fighting right now. Just the fact that even, even and I think that might stem from the fact that people don't you know, people might see the climate crisis as something that kills animals, that kills the environment, but does, doesn't necessarily kill us. But, you know, zero hour, that's why we're called zero hour, because this is zero hour to act on climate change. And we, we are killing ourselves in letting climate change continue to get worse. And so, yeah, I think um, fighting against people who just are stagnant on climate action is really one of the biggest barriers that we're facing right now. Thanks, Arielle. Yeah, there are, there are so many barriers and sometimes they feel overwhelming, but we, we have to kind of look at the barriers and see where we can chip away. 
Um, Alex, to you. Yeah, so, so I mean, some of my co-panelists have brought up some very uh, difficult um, political barriers, I would say, you know, the, this highly organized fossil fuel in industry and the organized fossil fuel interest groups. Um, I would uh, point to uh, more of a psychological barrier. And that is the notion that uh, climate change is just sort of a distant problem that can be left to another day uh, to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And this is unfortunately the mindset that I think many uh, of our leaders and many people in positions of power and authority, whether it be in government or in private industry, uh, seem to be caught up in. Um, I, I think that one of the really powerful things about the youth climate movement is that we are really bringing this discussion uh, to the fore and we are really reframing this as something that directly impacts us now and for the rest of our lives. Uh, to give one example, you know, many uh, young people today are making decisions about whether or not to have children, uh, partly based on climate change. You know, if, if, if uh, one of us has a child today or in the next decade, that, that person, that life is probably going to live uh, to the end of this century, if not uh, potentially into the, the, the next century. And so it's an open question now, really, whether there's going to be uh, a world worth living in at that point in, in history. And so this is something that, um, unfortunately, uh, many decision makers who are just simply of an older generation haven't really thought about that sort of issue and haven't had to grapple with climate change in such a personal way. And I think one of the really powerful things about you know, the youth climate movement and about efforts, you know, such as the Juliana case is that we are really putting that story and putting, putting our narrative in front of uh, our politicians and also in front of judges, including uh, our Supreme Court justices, uh, who are a little bit older than us and may simply not have, have thought about that or realized how serious uh, climate change really is for uh, people of our generation. Thank you, Alex. That's great. Uh, Jerome. Yes. Um, so uh, could you repeat the question? Um, it's sure. been a while. What do you see as the greatest barrier to solving climate change? Okay. So I'll say the biggest, the biggest, the only two barriers that we're facing right now is just corruption and complacency. And it's just governments being too corrupt to actually act and it's because of that corruption that we have like disinformation and now people are we're now trying to fix that and trying to actually change the narrative back to truth so i think that's the biggest thing is that we're trying to undo the the corruption of like the american media and, and just having a, a whole different narrative that's not true just being perpetuated and now we're just having to work backwards from that that's the only thing that we're that we're that's our barrier right now i think after that the technology's there the infrastructure is there the economy is there, and we're just waiting on government, which should be representative of the people, but right now it's not. And that's the biggest push that we're having right now to have government work for the people and have government be representative of its citizens. And that's the thing that we're trying to change right now to make sure that climate justice is seen as a real problem and that we can actually make sub substantial change in our country and around the world to make sure that our future is livable. Thank you so much, Jerome. Um, that concludes the questions that we're going to ask. Um, we have um, a couple of questions that we were planning to do a poll of the participants to see some. You had sent, you all had sent us some questions that you would like to uh, have our our people, our participants, um, answer. Unfortunately, our polling is actually not working tonight. Um, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty with that, but. Um, I'm going to ask a question of the of your of the participants of you the audience and if you choose to answer that you will put in the chat either a Y for yes a no for no or an NS for not sure and we'll give it a shot I've not done this in this way before but we'll, we'll try and maybe it'll work um, so the first 
uh, polling question I have is um, related to the to our children's trust um, uh, to the to our children's trust and uh, the and the lawsuit and it's do you believe securing the constitutional right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is a, an integral step in the climate movement's goal of ending the climate crisis so if you want to put in the chat whether you think yes or no or not sure we will tally this up and i'm watching the chat and it's so far um, from people who've responded it is a hundred percent yes nobody is even not sure about that so everybody believes that this is a constitutional right it's not um something that um it's just it, it is an inalienable right that we all have that is very clear from all of our participants so we have a lot of questions that we have in our q a and i'd like to start um, asking those questions and we'll if if it's not directed at a particular person what we'll do is um, just go around and have each of you share the responses. Um, this first one, please try and make it brief because we've got, I see 20 questions in the, in the Q&A right now. So you may be here all night. <laughs> and I know you don't want to be here all night. Um, the first question is, you spoke about a blueprint. And this is um, for Varshini. Has Sunrise endorsed a specific plan to reach the goals of the Green New Deal? and you a second part of that is that you spoke about electoral electoral activity and do you support governor insley's climate policy so okay i will keep this very very brief um okay. we so we did uh support governor insley's plan um we have a, a more fleshed out statement on it that's media and also on our Medium blog, if you check it out there, uh, it's just medium.com backslash sunrise MVMT, I think. And um, it, we didn't endorse it in full or anything, but there is a lot to love about it. And the uh, second question around, we have not endorsed a full plan yet. And currently there are other organizations and think tanks really working on the policy component of this. New Consensus is one organization who will be working over the next six to eight months to basically create policy that they can put in the hands of the next presidential administration. There is press fingers the turnover. Um, and I am happy to share more information about that right now, but I'll leave it. There. Thanks, Rashini. Um, our next question, and um, it, it can go to any one of you. Um, maybe the person who wants to answer is just Wave at me and you can answer. Um, how can we as elders provide support for the heroic actions that you all are taking? Who would like to uh, be able to respond to that? Ariel, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, I think this kind of goes along the lines of what we were talking about a little bit before on how elders can support the movement um, and engage with youth. Um, I think, you know, like, like a lot of us said earlier, just um, yeah, uh, talking to kids and grandkids about getting involved in the movement if they're not already. And um, just giving them, I think, encouragement can even help support. Just say, hey, you're doing a great job, you know, like, because it can get really hard to, you know, hear all these things on the news and like, do all of the work that a lot of people are doing um it can get frustrating it can get depressing and so even just offering words of encouragement i think can really help from elders um and yeah i think one thing as well that i forgot to mention earlier for the previous questions is that um i think writing press releases even could be cool um because while a lot of young people you know are sharing their stories through press releases and stuff like that um if elders share their support of the youth movement it can hopefully inspire other parents who read these press releases to allow their kids or encourage their kids to get involved as well thank you so we have another question um 
would, oh my gosh, my questions disappeared. Um, would young people call on their parents grand and grandparents to forego all birthday presents to their kids and grandkids until action is taken at a scale and with urgency to achieve the goals of the Green New Deal with the money they would have been spent would have spent going into a trust for our children's future um, and fund the movement activity. Very, very interesting question there. Um, let's see, who would like to take a stab at that one? Just give me a wave if you wanna try and answer that. Um, no one wants to answer that, Leah, it's how about a, you? It's a fund, sorry, can you explain it again? It's a, a foregoing gifts to fund the movement. Right, what, what, there, what this person is asking, would young people call on their parents and grandparents to forego all gifts and birthday presents to their children and grandkids' children until action is taken at a scale and with the urgency to achieve the goals of the Green New Deal? With the money they would have spent, put that into a fund, a trust fund, that would fund the movement. Did you want to take a stab at that, Barshini? I think Leah's on it. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so this idea of holding out or um, I can kind of compare it to a strike, for example, when children are saying, I will give up my education for broader climate action. Um, you know, it's, it's based on the idea that we're giving up something truly important and crucial for the function of society. Um, when students are not going to school, obviously that will hurt our human capital in the long run um, and it will make our economies uh, less productive and that will hurt everyone. So people have to act if no child is going to school. Um, and while I like the, the enthusiasm of, you know, having kids say, I only want climate action as a present, um, I don't think that withholding presence um, will get at the scope or disrupt um, our systems enough to um, have people, you know, forced to stop and look at the situation and say, okay, what, what is it going to take for you all to go back to how things used to run um, and back to societal expectations? Um, so I would suggest maybe, you know, grandparents, parents call on your, your young people to maybe have a birthday party going on strike or, you know, talking to their representatives, something maybe along those lines that still gets at that idea, um, but kind of takes, you know, just a little bit of a different approach. Thanks, Leah. I think that's a, a fabulous idea and it may be much more um, impactful anyway. And, um, and I hear a, a plea to give to the, um, the climate movement anyway. Um, so that, you know, that can, both things can be done. Um, so we have some more questions. Um, one person is asking, um, what about working at farmers markets or county fairs or, you know, engaging in those locations during the summer? Do you see that as part of your role? Um, or um, do you think that's just not a, a, an important piece thing to do? Um, Alex, what is your thought on that? Um. So the question is uh, whether working at a farmer's market or a uh, county fair could be ineffective. Well, I mean, I, I'm, coming back, com I'm, I'm coming from a uh, farming background. And so I will say that I think that uh, there is a very important role for sustainable agriculture to play uh, in addressing the climate crisis, including uh, sustainable forestry, uh, reforestation, and agricultural practices that are really going to sequester uh, carbon uh, from the atmosphere and into soils and into biomass. Um, that said, you know, my, uh, my focus at least is really on, you know, the more uh, legal and political uh, avenues of change uh, rather than on sort of the immediate, um, you know, attempts to sort of sell uh, more sustainable uh, agriculture and produce. Um, you know, so I think that there's definitely a role for both. And I think that we need to be looking at uh, how do, how does current uh, federal policy, including 
um, agricultural policy really prop up this massive uh, industrial agriculture industry, which is not good for people, it's not good for the planet, and it's also not good for uh, climate change because the, you know, heavily, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, mono, large monocrops that are heavily treated with uh, fertilizers and pesticides are not uh, going to be sequestering carbon and are instead going to be a source of carbon going into the atmosphere. So I definitely think that returning to a more small scale uh, local agriculture model is certainly something that we, we need to be doing uh, and we should be looking at how can we use uh, policy to really get us there. Um, of course, that's going to run into opposition from these very powerful uh, big ag companies. Um, but that, that is a fight that is going to need to be fought sooner or later. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to some more questions. This one is a little bit of a long question, um, prefaced by a big statement. So the fossil fuel industry is vast and is not going away quietly without a fight, but we can hit them where it hurts the most by taking away their customer demand, first by switching to clean sources of electricity and then using the clean power to move clean transportation and run clean buildings. Of course, this is a multi-decade proposition. Can young people dive deeply into the nuts and bolts of that transformation of the very deep fabric of our society? For example, prepping to be the ethical, well-prepared lawyers, politicians, and senior executives of the future. It will be a tough slog. So do you feel that you're gonna be well-prepared to take on this in the not just in the activism state, but in the professional state as, as lawyers, politicians, and executives. Um, who would like to take a stab at that? Ariel? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd like to answer a part of that question. Um, just from working in the envir movement, environmental movement for a while, um, a lot of the young people that I have met um, are now going to college to study things like environmental science and to be lawyers and doc and um you know other professions that can help fight the climate crisis um and so while we do have a long way to go and while it will be really tough um it's inspiring to see a lot of people going to college to study for to prepare for this fight great thank you and i see alex go ahead yeah, I mean, I have a couple of, of points to make in response to that question. I mean, first, I think absolutely, you know, uh, we are the lawyers, the politicians, the executives uh, of the future. Um, but we can't necessarily just be thinking about, you know, 10 or 20 years in the future uh, when we really have a climate emergency on our hands right now. And so we've got to think short term and long term. Um, and be really committing to action that's going to start moving us in the right direction in the next couple of years and be really starting now to lay the groundwork uh, that we will then be prepared to lead uh, in a few years or in a few decades um, into the future. Um, one point that I really want to make is that we are, I think, at a tr tr uh, profoundly transformative moment uh, in our society, in our politics, and also in uh, the demographics um, of the US. And the, you know, the, the whether, whether you wanna call it the millennials or Generation Z, and I think those boundaries are a little bit blurry, but the, the age group of people that today are uh, 18 to 34 years old um, constitute about 75 million people uh, within the U.S. Um, and of a country of about 300 million people. Um, so right around a quarter of the population. And we really are an overwhelmingly uh, progressive uh, generation where about 75% of that age group um, disapproves of the current president, whose name I will not uh, mention. So I think we really are poised to create you know, tremendous and profound change to our politics, to our society, to our economy. Um, you know, and I don't know 
when exactly that will happen. It could be in the next few years or it could be in the next uh, few decades. But it's incredibly important that we start uh, that we start acting now. And I'm incredibly encouraged to see that, you know, really uh, beginning to happen, including through, you know, many of the organizations that are represented here on the panel, you know, including, including Sunrise, including uh, Zero Hour um, and everyone else. Thanks, Alex. Leah. Yeah, I, I want to, I agree with all the statements that have been said. I just want to add another aspect to this question. Um, so the question asks, will we, are we prepared to dive into this in the future and be these next leaders? And I just want to kind of reframe our thought on what does it mean to be a leader? Um, and too often we're saying that the adults are the leaders um, and you have to be a certain age to be able to achieve these great things. But we're already seeing from so many young people, from people who are you know, teenagers, uh, students in high school, students in college, we're already doing a lot of these things that are traditionally um, assigned to adults to do. For example, with uh, Minnesota Can't Wait, we sat down with legislators, we sat down with uh, bill writers. It was young people in this room who were driving the creation process of this policy work. Um, before this webinar, I was just at a meeting with my uh, city council members to talk about the nuts and bolts of our um, climate action plan and the presentation of that and how the city is going to um, respond and work with that. So we are prepared to do that in the future, but we already are doing it now. Um, and it shows the extent to which um, we're, we're not waiting to do anything. You know, Minnesota can't wait. Our, our slogan says it all, we can't wait to do anything. We're just jumping into it right now um, and figuring out the best that we can along the way. And obviously with support from adults who are, who are helping us in this transition as well. Thanks, Leah. You you really hit it. Um, you you are you are already doing the hard work um, and working at a professional level while you're in high school, college, or just graduating. Jerome, I know you wanted to um, address this issue also. You are muted, Jerome. Yeah, so basically I was saying that um, how we are best prepared in the future to tackle climate change is ultimately, ultimately from the perspective of education and educating my generation to actually be able from, K, from kindergarten to PhD levels to actually educate people through the Climate Change Education Act. Um, it was just introduced in both the House and the Senate this year and was already um, introduced last year. And basically it talks about how they can have climate science as a class and it will teach the fundamentals about climate science and about climate change so that we're no longer just arguing over the validity of the crisis but trying to find viable solutions and effective solutions and if we teach climate science in kindergarten and first grade and second grade then it will change the narrative where children are drawing houses they'll now draw houses with solar panels on them and with wind turbines beside them and it will just create a new culture where climate advocate climate change is and green technology is seen as a norm is seen as expected and when they don't see a wind turbine or they don't see a, a solar panel on the top of a house it's uh, it's weird and it's not normal and just starting from early um actually supporting that bill and making sure that it passes will change how generations think and change how my generation and future generations will be able to understand climate change understand climate science and i think educating um future generations is the long game that's how we can make sure that we are effective not just in the short term with the green new deal and um and just other legislation that will impact now but the climate change education act will impact future generations in schools and we don't have to rely on social media and basically um reading on our own to learn about climate change but to actually be taught it so that it is given the it's 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 importance in schools and is given the amount of the the and it's given all the way up to college. And I think that um, another important aspect of the Climate Change Education Act, which I really want to stress, is that when you go to college, it will offer $100 million to students over to be able to give, do research and to do climate research. And that will significantly help with battery technology and with the general advancement of green technology. And investing in legislation like that and making sure that our politicians are making sure that it passes the House and passes the Senate and becomes a law, that's, I think that will be one of the long games on how we can make sure that climate change is tackled in the future as well. 
Thank you, Jerome. We are, are just about out of time, but I want to read to you, the panelists, some of the comments from that are in the chat box that you might not have seen. Um, this one is, I'm 76 years old and have been engaged in climate change activities for over a decade. I periodically go through periods of burnout. Watching you all and seeing your enthusiasm and creativity is regenerative and inspiring. And I think there are other people who would feel the same way. We also had a, um, a comment question, which you may or may not want to answer. What are you, and this would have to be really brief because we're just about out of time. What do each of you feel and what do you experience inside of you when you go to bed each night? You know, what, the, what is that feeling to you? Um, does anybody want to um, take a stab and, and sort of make a statement on that? Hi, um, yeah. before you all sit, um, do that, I just want to let you know that I have to leave. Um, my SAT tutor is here, and I take SAT on Saturday, so I do have to go. Thank you so much, Jerome. You have been a wonderful asset to this, and we are inspired by what you do. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jerome. Good luck on your SATs. Leah. Yeah, so to answer that question, I think I feel most overwhelmingly um, a sense of guilt. And I say guilt because... I see a problem in front of me, the climate crisis, and I know that there are more ways that I can always continue to spread the word or participate in more organizations or do more. And sometimes it never feels like I'm doing enough and that not enough people are, are hearing my cry for, for action. Um, so, you know, I, I feel guilty sometimes taking a break and going on a bike ride or watching TV. Um, and I don't think I deserve to feel guilty for for relaxing. So, um, you know, it's frustrating that I have to feel this guilt and carry this with me. Um, but, you know, I just, you know, I work, I try to work hard every day and make more progress so that that guilt is not, you know, overpowering and in the end uh, causes a burnout so that I, I don't make any progress at all. Thank you. Um, I, I can tell you that I and probably many of us feel that same way um, every day of how can we do more and we're not doing enough. But one thing I can tell you is we need to all take care of ourselves too. So you need to take that bike ride when you feel you should. And you know we are more effective if we've taken care of ourselves also. So, uh, and I, I, I think we all feel that same guilt and maybe the, older, the elders feel it a little more because we have made some major contribution to this mess. Um, although we are not um, the fossil fuel money, but you know we have participated in many ways in this mess, and we feel like we we need to work on fixing it to make it right for you and your children and your grandchildren. So um, I'm going to close now. I'd like to thank you all. I am personally so inspired by what you do. I'm honored that you are um, participate in this webinar with us. Um, and all I can say is whatever we can do to support you, um, we, we want to support you. We want to take action too. Um, we have some skills, we may have some money, we may have some time and, and resources, and we want to be able to use that um, to really work together and solve this problem. Um, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this and for all that you do. And to the participants, I hope you've enjoyed, um, enjoyed this webinar series, and I hope you've enjoyed this particular one, which has been I, I, unbelievably inspirational for me, I can tell you. Um, you'll receive the recording um, and the bios tomorrow. And um, when you receive that, we're also going to put in the, some of the polling questions so that we can actually um, get you to respond to the, you know, get the participants to respond to those. And we will pass that information on to the panel because that was, uh, those were questions that they have created. Um, there's some 
addresses, um, webbed addresses in the chat box if anybody wants to pick those up. But I'd like to thank you all. And I would ask also if you have enjoyed this series, we would like to continue to be able to bring this to you in the future. We're planning a fall series of, um, of webinars. So if you can find it in your heart and in your checkbook to make a small donation, we would really appreciate it. And um, with that, have everybody have a great weekend and thank you so much panelists you guys are awesome thank you yeah yeah thank you so much for this thank you thank and you. stay in touch with us um you know we want to support you and we'll be there for you and you know we'll ask you to support us in some ways also so thanks a lot